This evening we have the honor of Josh Needleman talking about parking American style, and the program is going to be emceed by Stuart Wood, who is Sustainable Claremont's executive director. And uh, I think uh, Stuart is going to say something about some coming events, but I'm going to talk about one uh, for which uh, Drew Reedy was a great help, and that is on February 3rd, at the same time here, 7 o'clock, there's going to be a program on safe, clean water program. Um, that really uh, evolves from Measure W, which was passed in L.A. County in 2018. And there are a great many advantages that come from this that uh, uh, we'll hear about from some as yet unknown person from the Los Angeles County Public Works Flood Control Division. Uh, we've had a hard time scheduling that because days when this building was open and people from that uh, department were available um, turned out to be quite an adventure. But I think we have it all set now, so if you want to put in your notebooks that that's going to be on February 3rd, a discussion of safe, clean water program as uh, evolved from Measure W, and it, it's just amazing the good things that are going to happen from that. Well, with this, I think I'll turn it over to Stuart, tell you some more things about sustainable Claremont activities, and introduce the speaker. Okay, thank you, Freeman. Um, just a, a couple upcoming events that I wanted to um, announce before we get started. Uh, this Wednesday, there's a garden club meeting. Um, they're talking about uh, gray water, I believe, this week. And on Saturday, we have a uh, green crew tree workshop. Um, so that should be really interesting. We're going to have Dave Roger, who's with the city, of course, uh, come teach us how to uh, prune and about tree care. Uh, so a lot of good stuff coming up this week. Um, and just a quick announcement um, to introduce our guest here tonight, uh, Dr. Jason Needleman. Um, I've known Jason for almost 20 years now, which is a little crazy. Yeah, yeah. I used to serve him coffee while he was a professor, and now um, he was actually one of the reasons why I went on to do my PhD in political science, which I'll never forgive him for. Um, so we're, we're happy to have him here back uh, tonight. Uh, if you came to our Green New Deal um, dialogue just a couple weeks ago, Jason was here to present on the political theory and the underpinnings on the Green New Deal, how it relates to the original New Deal. So he comes at this with a, a sort of philosophical approach, but also very pragmatic, and I think we'll see that tonight. Uh, Jason's a distinguished professor of arts and sciences and professor of political science at the University of Laverne. Uh, he teaches political theory, politics, philosophy, history, law. He's the author of The General Will is Citizenship, Inquiries into French Political Thought, and Rousseau's Ethics of Truth, A Sublime Science of the Simple Souls. Excuse me, of simple souls. His current research is on politics and storytelling, where he proposes a narrative model of politics according to both political theory and political ideology, um, and how they're analyzed as forms of storytelling. So really interesting sort of approach to these types of things. He also teaches a class on urban land use where parking and parking policy is heavily featured. So I think a, a, a perfect um, speaker for tonight's topic, and one that I've been looking forward to for a long time. And with that, Jason Needleman. Thank you to Sustainable Claremont for, for having me back to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Probably asking yourself why parking would be someone's favorite subject. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, first, I just want to thank Stuart for that introduction. It's a lot to live up to, for sure. Um, and I didn't know some of that stuff, so you know, that was... That was <laughs> I didn't know that it was my fault that he, that he went and did, a, or at least partly my fault that he went and did a PhD. Um, my primary field, as you could probably tell from Stuart's introduction, is political theory or political philosophy, but I've had a long-standing interest in urban land use, first as an activist, um, and then when I arrived at the University of Laverne um, as an instructor, I designed a course focused on urban land use um, in which... Um, Parking, as Stuart said, plays a significant role. Um, why do I enjoy talking about parking so much? People ask me that all the time. 
and, and my kids have this game where they, uh, they, 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 they chastise one another if they happen to get on a topic where dad has a speech. And parking is one of the ones where I can really go on. Stuart made a joke about three hours. I won't go for that long. I promise you that. Um, but the reason I think parking is so interesting for me um, is because it's an area where the arguments tend to be really bad. And as a political theorist or political philosopher, I'm attracted to good, uh, well-designed arguments, and I have an aversion to arguments um, that are bad or poorly executed. And I think that this is an area where we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of science, but we don't always apply it. The public policy around parking is a kind of mother load of bad arguments, I'm gonna argue. And I think some of what I say here might be a little bit unpopular. Um, it definitely has been when I've <coughs> talked about parking in other settings, but let me just out myself as a uh, shupista. Do we have any here? You guys can tell me what I get, what I get right and what I get wrong. Um, Donald Shoup's professor of economics at UCLA. He's focused primarily over the course of his career on parking. And he's most famous for a big book on parking called The High Price of Free Parking. Well, what does it mean to call oneself a Shoupista? I'm gonna get into that. There are certain specific principles, but fundamentally what it means for me is that I Embrace the science around parking. There is a science around parking. I don't think, uh, you know, it's a little bit like climate change. You either believe the science or you reject it. And that's sort of how I see being a Shapista. It's just a question of whether you embrace the social science that's grown up around parking or whether you opt not to. And I'll talk in a second about all the reasons that we maybe prefer not to accept the science around parking. Parking is something that we know a lot about, but that we um, often fail to, to but, but it's knowledge that we often fail to, fail to apply. <coughs> I saw this on uh, Twitter. That really captures something that I've seen in my work as an activist. We have decided that we want parking to be free, that we want parking to be plentiful, and that we always want to get a spot right in front of wherever we're going. And, and, and we've been willing to pay a big price in order to have those things. Of course, you can almost never have all of them, although I did notice I got a spot right in front here tonight. Um, that's a real rarity, because uh, I live in LA, so I don't get to experience that too much. Um, Typically, Americans follow what we might call the George Costanza philosophy of parking. Paying for parking is like going to a prostitute. Why should I pay when, if I apply myself, maybe I can get it for free? We don't want to pay for parking if we can ever avoid it. I had that experience today. I was running around to doctors. I had a little minor surgery, so if I get anything wrong, it's the drugs, it's not me. Um, and, 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 you know, the parking was very expensive, so I was trying to find spots on the street. We all do it. We all try to avoid paying for parking if we can. And what I'm going to argue tonight is that we have to create a market for parking. We have to price parking. Not necessarily a capitalist market, because we, the people, will collectively own the parking meters and the revenue from parking. And by the way, there will be a place for capitalism as well in the construction of off-street parking. But what we need to do is create a market. For some reason, we all become communists when it comes to parking. Parking turns conservatives, even conservatives, into communists. We want it free, we want it available at all times, and we want it both free and always available right next to our destination. Just to give you an example, my secretary years ago, both of her students were at the University of Laverne, and she worked at the University of Laverne. Almost every day they came in three separate cars. Why? Because given uh, the opportunity, we will prefer to drive alone. It is more convenient. 
if you have to stop somewhere on the way home. Unless you price parking appropriately, people will opt to drive in a single occupancy vehicle most of the time. And the solution, unfortunately, for, um, for some is going to involve putting a price on parking. Now, some people are not only sa not, not satisfied with having a free parking spot right where they want it, always available. They want, uh, if they have a nice car, sometimes they want two parking spots. Have you seen this? Because they don't want anyone to park next to them either. And um, in case you were looking for proof that uh, not all heroes wear capes, That's, uh, that's one of my heroes, the guy who did that. Or woman. Who's the hero now? <laughs> Definitely not the Corvette that took up two parking spots. Um, parking is something we have strong feelings about, but we don't think much about. We often end up holding opinions with respect to parking that we wouldn't hold with respect to any other political issue. I mean, it's kind of true for me. I, uh, my students are always shocked that I advocate a market for parking or, or, or for driving during rush hour because typically I'm a lefty and I tend to criticize um, markets. Some of us are politically very much in favor of market prices, except when it comes to parking. We want, we want parking to be free. Some of us politically strongly in opposition to government subsidies, except for parking. We want the city to provide parking for free. Some of us are opposed to planning regulations, except for parking. We want every establishment to have X number of parking spots to accommodate all visitors. We want it free, plentiful, and proximate. If drivers actually paid the full cost of their parking, it would seem to us to be too expensive. So instead, we expect someone else to pay for it. But a city where everyone happily pays for everyone else's free parking is a fool's paradise. And I'll explain some of the costs of our collective decision to provide free parking most of the time. An example, a recent study found that the parking spaces required for shopping centers in Los Angeles increased the cost of building a shopping center by 67% if the parking is an above ground structure and by 93% if the parking is underground. Retailers pass this high cost on to all shoppers, regardless of how they travel. Even if you didn't drive, you're still paying that cost. People who cannot afford to buy a car pay more for their groceries so that richer people can park for free when they drive to the store. So we are paying for parking in all of our capacities other than as a driver. So you pay it every time you pay for parking, every time you go to a store, you pay for parking when you pay your rent and so on. Depending on how you price it, some estimates indicate that we spend more on subsidized parking than we do on Medicare. Underground parking can be up to $100,000 per spot, depending on where it's built. Parking in a structure can be up to $50,000. Surface parking is usually $5,000 to $10,000 per spot. And by the way, each one of these spots is about 350 square feet, if you count the space that you need to maneuver the cars in and out. The spot itself isn't that big. But that's how much space you have to allocate per parking spot, 350 square feet. You know, that's about enough for a small studio apartment. Each one of those spots. A small one. <laughs> I lived in 550. Uh, 350 would be tough, but... With the housing crisis that we have, I'm sure people would be happy to do it if it was... Um, a high quality apartment. We accommodate cars for very little, but we're doing a terrible job of accommodating human beings in housing. What we've done is solve the affordable housing problem, but for cars instead of for people. I'll give you an example. My parents, um, this is hard to hear for those of us who bought houses recently, but my parents bought their house in Palo Alto for $39,000 in, in 1969. At that time, it was 15 cents an hour to park in downtown Palo Alto. Now, the houses are in the millions. 
and it's free to park. So what we've done is create urban space in which cars are privileged over people. Let me start with a basic question. What is the right price for a good or service? And I'll just give you some examples. This first one is this nod to Stuart. I was going to put a quart of milk, but he turned me on to oat milk. It's expensive, though. Anyway, I don't know, a quart of milk, 249 maybe, something like that. Oat milk, probably a lot more, five bucks. Smartphone. You don't have to answer, but you're welcome to. A bicycle, another nod to Stuart. A house, obviously it's gonna vary based on supply and demand. And of course, based on public policy as well. Education, we're at a college. I don't know what tuition here is, but I'm sure high. I'm looking at colleges for my son. He's gonna apply next year. Healthcare, we talk about that a lot. Of course, parking. Parking's the one that we want to exempt from that conversation. We recognize that there is a price for all of the other things there, and that it's based on a variety of factors, primarily supply and demand, but other things too. But with respect to parking, well, we don't want to subject parking to those ordinary market forces. And the consequence of our collective decision to exempt parking from the market are widespread and mostly detrimental, I'm going to try to argue. I want to play for you a brief history of parking. This is from, um, this is from Vox, just a short video. And we've come up with a, a design that puts 12,000 people in one building. Four months before he died in 2011, Steve Jobs made his final public appearance, pitching Apple's new campus, which opened this year. Central to his vision was turning existing parking lots into a green landscape. The overall feeling of the place is gonna be a zillion times better than it is now with all the asphalt. So we'd like to plant a lot of trees, including some apricot orchards. But Jobs didn't mention that the new parking structure on campus would have more floor space than the office building. That's because it wasn't Apple's plan. The decision came from the city of Cupertino, which demanded 11,000 parking spots for the campus. But Cupertino is hardly unique. It's estimated that in America, there are eight parking spots for every car, covering up to 30% of our cities and collectively taking up about as much space as the state of West Virginia. The more parking we have, the more we're able to drive. So the rules that manage our parking not only influence the way we move around, but also shape our urban landscapes. If you look at pictures of the American cities around 1920 and 1930, all of the curbs are just completely filled with parked cars. And they couldn't use prices to manage demand because the parking meter wasn't even invented until 1935. This is Donald Shoup, an urban planning professor at University of California, Los Angeles, whose specialty is parking. As cars filled cities in the early 20th century, two inventions came to dominate parking management throughout the United States. The first was the parking meter. The meter manufacturers popularized the parking meters. So they offered them free to cities, and they kept the revenue until the meter was paid for in about six months, and then the city got all the revenue. They offered to install them on one side of the street only, so people could see how it worked on one side and how it worked on the other. At the same time the parking meter was invented, cities invented the idea of off-street parking requirements. Off-street parking requirements, also known as mandatory parking minimums, are the second invention. And though you may not be aware of them, most of the parking lots you're used to exist because of these rules in the background. Look at any place from the air, any suburban place from the air, you'll see an awful lot of land taken up for parking. And most people don't know why. It's our policy that we require our cities to be built with a lot of parking. So what that does is it spreads out the city. And it makes it less walkable. It makes it more um, convenient 
for drivers at the expense of pedestrians, and of course the effect is that people have to drive. As I said, what we need to do is create a market, which means charging the right price for parking. This is called performance-based parking. And we can define what that is. But it involves varying the price of parking based on demand, typically so that you have one or two free spots on any block. So what you're striving for is something like 85% uh, occupancy. A lot of the cars on the road at any given time in a congested area are circling for parking. People have done studies. I'm from Northern California. In San Francisco, it's, it's sometimes over 50% of the traffic in the city is people looking for a parking spot. This is, this is from um, Donald Shoup's recent uh, book. Um, what, what's, it's out of Rutledge. The new, anyway, it's an up, it's a collection of um, scholarship based on the high cost of free parking. Anyway, a summary of 22 studies of cruising in downtowns found the share of traffic that was cruising for parking ranged between 8% and 74%, with an average of 34%. The average time to find a curb space ranged between 3.5 and 14 minutes, with an average of 7.5 minutes. And if you apply principles of performance-based parking, people very quickly, drivers, motorists are extremely adaptive. And that's because you only have to operate at the margins to have major changes. So what people will do is quickly come to realize how much it's going to cost to drive to a certain place at a certain time. And they'll make a determination whether it's worth it to them to drive or to maybe shift their travel time to another time of day, or maybe to find some alternate means of of transit or to defer the, the trip. And of course, you also have the advantage of eliminating the, the circling for, for parking. So that's part of what Donald Shoup and the Shoupista movement um, advocates. The other element, it was referenced in that video, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit more uh, on that in a second. The other element is to sharply curtail, if not abolish, these standards for mandatory minimum parking. In other words, to really rely on curbside parking and be very reluctant to build additional parking beyond the curb. I'll talk about circumstances where it may be appropriate to do so. And this is a little more Shoup talking about mandatory minimums. Off-street parking requirements uh, really spread throughout the United States faster than almost any other urban planning invention. They arose partly because of the lack of management of on-street parking. If you can't manage the on-street parking properly, you need off-street parking requirements or everybody will say, how did you let this building be built when there's not enough parking? A typical requirement looks like this. For every 1,000 square feet of new building, there has to be a set number of parking spots, which varies by land use. You have to have a parking spaces per something. There could be a number of spaces per bassinet at a hospital, or per holes at a golf course, or per 1,000 gallons of water at a swimming pool. One of the oddest ones is for a funeral home, because that's sort of the you know, parking spaces per what? An average parking spot requires about 330 square feet, which includes car storage and empty space, allowing the car to move in and out and for doors to open. That means if a policy requires three spots per thousand square feet, the parking lot needs to be the size of the building. And many parking requirements need more spots. A restaurant may need 10 spots per thousand square feet, making the parking lot over three times larger than the restaurant. Planners don't have any training in how to set them. There's really no way to say how much parking every building needs. So there's a pseudoscience that has grown up. It's like. Like, uh, like bloodletting, you know, which was a major form of medical treatment for a couple thousand years. And they look just like parking requirements today. Building parking is expensive, especially when it involves a large construction project. We pay for the, the free parking that we demand in every role we have in life other than as a driver, as a taxpayer, as a resident, as a shopper. 
And just because you pay nothing at the parking lot at the grocery store, doesn't mean the cost goes away. It's still there. It's just that the driver isn't paying for it. Developers who don't comply with parking requirements pay tens of thousands of dollars in fees for every spot that they don't include. A lot of times, these costs prohibit new development. This is some of the most valuable land on Earth. Land is expensive for, for housing, but it's free for parking. And you wonder why we have a problem? Parking requirements often result in more parking space than building space, pushing buildings further apart from each other, making it harder to walk, and encouraging more driving. Many of the dense cities that we love, like Paris or Washington DC or Amsterdam or New York, wouldn't look like this with parking requirements. These arbitrary rules continue to shape the growth of our cities and increase traffic congestion. You could argue there's an inverse relationship between the beauty of a city and the requirement of off-street parking. So, as Professor Shoup said there, city planners really have no idea how many parking spots to allocate for a given use. I don't know if anyone's been involved in this kind of local politics, but I was on a homeowners association in LA for 10 years, and we're constantly fighting over this. And there was no science to it at all. Most of the time what city planners do is they just kind of look at what other cities have done and copy it. Um, or maybe they rely on surveys. It's more sorcery than science, as he said, like bloodletting. And what these parking requirements do is make the city friendly to cars, but not to people, drivable, but not walkable. Everything is spread out. This is one of my heroes, Jane Jacobs. Um, the more downtown is broken up and interspersed with parking lots and garages, the duller and deader it becomes, and there is nothing more repellent than a dead downtown. I highly recommend Jane Jacobs if you don't know her. Also, uh, James C. Scott's um, Seeing Like a State, where he has a couple chapters on, on Jane Jacobs. There is a better way. There is a better way than mandatory minimum requirements. And here we come to what I referred to at the beginning, these basic principles uh, of performance-based parking. Three basic principles. I'm going to expand them a little bit at the end. First, market-priced curb parking, variable based on demand. You can have a maximum, minimum, but it varies over the course of the day with the goal of one or two open spots on every block. Parking benefit districts. The revenue generated from these meters needs to be reinvested in the community for political reasons. That's what gets the community to, 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 um, to, to accept and eventually value performance-based parking because it generates a lot of revenue that can be reinvested in their communities. But it's very important not to take the revenue out of the community from which it's raised. So that's for political reasons that you want to create these parking benefit districts. And, and by the way, um, it's very plausible to give discounts to local residents. You can charge local residents half um, often, I guess some cities have found that you have these repeat offenders. Sometimes 50% of the parking tickets come from these repeat offenders, people who just decide, I'm just going to park wherever I want, and you've probably seen these people who just keep paying parking tickets. It's just worth it to them to be able to park wherever they want. Um, so you can have policies to address repeat offenders. You can have policies to address residents if you want to charge less to, to, to local residents. But the key is that the revenue be returned to the community. And then the third principle, no mandatory minimums, no off-street parking requirements. There can be exceptions to that. If there's a market demand, here's where capitalism comes in, um, developers can build parking um, and sell it at a market price. And, 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 and that's where the market can, can function to provide off-street parking if um, performance-based curb parking doesn't seem to be quite enough, although the evidence is that if you manage curbside parking well, it's effective. You're not going to need to build um, off-street lots.
public support. That, can you guys see that? So liberals will see it increases public spending because you raise revenue, gives you the opportunity to reinvest in the neighborhood. Conservatives will see it relies on markets and reduces government regulation. Because you can build, I wanna, if we have time, I wanna show you a, just a Reddit post that I show my students by an architect in LA who talks about how it's impossible to build afford affordable housing with these mandatory minimum parking requirements. And if, um, and, and I had a look at some of the documents from the, the um, TOD uh, Claremont proposal that you guys are looking at. And that seems to be part of the spirit that's animating that as well. If you can reduce parking requirements or maybe even eliminating them, you eliminate them, you can build more affordable housing. Environmentalists will see it reduces energy consumption and emissions. Businesses will see that it spurs enterprise. You want to have that turnover. I always do the same bike ride and run. And I see this one car <laughs> parked in that same meter every time all day. That's not good for business. I live in LA. And so what this does is it has a lot of turnover and so it benefits business because they can cycle customers through. New urbanists will see that it improves design. Libertarians will see that it increases choice and reduces regulation on land use. So when I talk about choice, if you want to have one car, you can, as long as the regulations, the mandatory minimums are removed, you can rent an apartment that has one parking spot. If you want to have two, you can rent an apartment that has two parking spots. If you want to have three cars, rent an apartment that comes with three parking spots. If you want to have no cars, rent an apartment that doesn't come with a parking spot. And now you're not making lower income people subsidize free parking for higher income people. Elected public officials will see that it reduces traffic, encourages infill redevelopment, and pays for public services without raising taxes. The other thing that happens when you price parking based on demand is that richer people can park closer to the destination for a higher price. Poorer people can park a little bit further, make a decision to walk a little bit, instead of everyone paying the exact same price at every meter. And so that adds flexibility in that way as well. If a city removes its parking requirements, developers will provide whatever parking spaces the market demands. As I said, someone who owns three cars can rent an apartment with three parking spaces. A resident who doesn't own a car at all can pay lower rent in exchange for a parking space. Free or subsidized off-street parking, in short, is a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. As I said, I show this to my students. I find it very interesting. I'm an architect in LA. This is from Reddit. Specializing in multifamily residential. I'd like to do my best to explain a little understood reason why all new large development in LA seems to be luxury development. A big part of my job is to spec and mass potential new large-scale developments for developers who are consul considering building in LA at a particular site. Understanding the code and limitations makes it pretty easy to understand why no developers in the city seem to be making the lower cost units everyone wants. Everything in LA is defined by parking, whether we like it or not. More specifically, everything is defined by our parking code. Los Angeles, unlike say New York, has extremely strict parking code for all residential occupancies. For all buildings in an R4 zone, AKA condos and rental units with more than three units, each unit is required to have one full-size dedicated parking space. Compact spaces are not allowed, nor tandem spaces. In making our assessments as to required space for parking, the typical calculation is that full parking, each full parking stall will require 375 square feet. So it varies, it kind of depends if it's a structure, a driveway, parking lot like they, you saw there outside the market in the, in the video. So that 800 square foot apartment is actually 1,175 square feet to build. But wait, there's more. The parking space for each unit either has to be at ground level, which is the most valuable real estate on the whole project, or it has to be above or below ground. Going underground is astronomically expensive, as I said earlier, primarily due to removing all that dirt. 
and other reasons. Even going up above grade is problematic, given that the required dead load of vehicle parking makes for exp an expensive structure. So not only is 32% of your apartment just for your car and otherwise useless, but it's also by far the most expensive part of the apartment to build. And he talks about required open space as well, common open space, that's particular to LA. So now that 800 square foot apartment you're building is actually a 1,275 square foot apartment with a garden and a large parking space. Well, what if we wanted to take that 800 square feet and divide it into smaller rooms so a low income family could live there? No, we can't. The required parking and open space are defined by the number of habitable rooms in the unit. And he goes on. But at the end of the day, the key point that I want to emphasize is that it's really because we start all residential development from the parking requirement. And he, he says, this is why you will never again see a new skyscraper in Los Angeles with condos selling for the lower middle class. They literally can't build a legal building to code and charge acceptably without destroying their own businesses. Just to break even, our developer for this project would need to charge $207 per square foot. Now consider the cost of land, all-time high, cost of tower, capable contractors in Los Angeles, and so on. It comes to $300 per foot, just to break even. And then the too long didn't read version. Los Angeles right now is simply incapable of building affordable rental and condo towers. The only way to make a new high-rise building cost-effective is to make luxury units because what would be luxury amenities in New York or Chicago are required in Los Angeles by the building code, not optional. That was okay back when LA had cheap land and cheap construction, but our land and labor costs have caught up to other cities. So the reason I like to emphasize this is it seems to me that there are developers who would build affordable housing. I mean, the governor estimates that we need 4 million housing units in California. There are developers who would do it, but they can't do it with the requirement of these, uh, with these mandatory minimum requirements. Okay. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Principles of performance-based parking. I gave you the three main ones. This is what I submitted to my university when we built the structure that you see on Arrow. When you drive by University of Laverne, I tried to convince them that that's not how you build a parking structure. We basically were extorted by the city of Laverne to do it. They said they wouldn't approve any of our projects unless we built a massive structure because they didn't want our students and staff and faculty and so on spilling over into the streets of Laverne. But I sent this to the uh, vice president of, of, um, of, of the space and the building in space. Um, he didn't follow it, but he did say the next year that he went to a conference and he said, now I get it. So first, place a moratorium on the construction of off-street parking. Second, elim eliminate mandatory minimum parking requirements. Third, and here we get how you might defend building a parking structure. Conduct regular audits of congestion and adjust prices accordingly. So you have to do audits, you have to see, in order to know what price to apply. So that you can have, if it's a block, one spot per block, or if it's a lot, one or two spots always available in a parking lot. So you have to do audits to, to get a sense of, of demand and then set prices accordingly. All parking should be priced. Prices should increase and decrease based on demand over the course of the day. Maybe there could be an exception for handicap spots, but other than that, all parking should be priced, which includes designating residential, designated residential parking permits. Those should be priced as well. Um, to maximize efficiency. Set prices by the Goldilocks principle, that's that 85%. Try to get where you have 85% occupancy. Ensure some level of vacancy on each block or lot. Decrease prices if multiple spaces remain open. Increase prices to prevent circling for parkings. Invest revenues from parking fees in the neighborhood. We talked about that, these parking districts. It's for purposes of building political support sometimes called parking benefit districts. And then build new parking based on data from the audits. In general, as I've said, we wanna avoid trying to build off-street parking. 
But if you conduct regular audits and the lots are at maximum capacity and, um, and you keep increasing the price, it may be the case that you need to build more parking. The other reason the audits are so important is you want to see where parking is impacted when you make the decision where to build the lot. Because you have a sense of where people want to park and you can factor that into your decision as to where you build the parking structure if you do it. And ideally, new parking, uh, off-street parking, will be built by the private sector. And, the, the, and, and, the, and the, the, the government, the public sector, will focus on raising revenue through properly pricing curbside parking. So only build new parking when demand persists even once prices are high. And as I reviewed the documents um, that Stuart sent um, with respect to the TOD development in Claremont, it seems to me as though a lot of these principles are, there's an attempt to incorporate a lot of these principles into the, the design of that new development. So that was very good to see. I was very happy to see that. And I'd like to, I know I would say they could do better, you know, based on what I saw, they could do better. But um, I thought it was good progress in that direction. Thank you. Questions, comments, corrections. Uh, we're in crisis mode here. The, the Pell mic isn't working. Uh, in questions and answer sessions, in order to record properly, the speaker needs to hold this microphone and the answerer needs to hold it also. So as we go into questions, if you have a question, would you please raise your hand and somebody will bring you the microphone. And in the meantime, I'll see if I can find another one. I noticed one, one word never appeared in that entire presentation, that is freedom, freedom of mobility. Um, we, we use our cars for freedom of, mo of mobility, we use uh, our feet for freedom of, mo of mobility. That's sort of a tongue twister for me. Um, so if we're gonna charge for parking, maybe we should start charging people to stand as well. I mean, the, if the, the logic and the principle would be the same thing. Um, it's just a matter of getting from point A to point B, and I, I think as a society, and perhaps you can respond to this, the, uh, we've, we've sort of made a decision that in, in order to allow people to move from spot to spot as they choose, we've, we've accepted the cost, as you put it, of free parking, quote unquote, that as you say, is not free, but uh, we've accepted the, the extended costs of that. And uh, the, the, other, the, the other question that occurred to me is, is what is the ultimate motivation for doing this? Because the revenues would not flow to any market entity, they would flow to government. Um, thank you. The, the, I do think there's, um, at least implicit reference to freedom in some of these arguments. Um, for example, your freedom to make a determination as to whether you want to live in a unit that comes with one, two, three, zero parking spaces, as opposed to having to pay for two parking spaces simply because you're in a two-bedroom unit. Um, and, 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 uh, it increases the freedom of developers as well, in the sense that they can have many more options in terms of the kinds of development, as you saw in that Reddit post. But I understand what you're getting at, which is, not, which is a different kind of freedom, which is freedom of mobility. Well, I guess I would say, how's free parking with mandatory minimums working out? And it seems to me not great, um, depending on where you are. From a variety of perspectives, it's not working out great. It's causing congestion 
what you can think of as a restriction on freedom of mobility, right? Um, because mandatory minimum parking spreads cities out, you need a car in order to get from place to place. There's a kind of freedom that we can, I think, all recognize in being able to walk from place to place, which you recuperate if you eliminate mandatory minimum requirements. And we see that in some of these cities that we love the most. You know, I was just in Spain over the summer, and you see people out. That's a kind of a freedom, you know, that I kind of lament that I don't have when I was in Spain over the summer, that you just walk outside. There's tons of people, and you can access beautiful public spaces and restaurants and bars. So I guess my response would be, you know, it sort of depends on how you think about freedom. Well, I show my students this um, picture of 100 people driving, 100 people cycling, and 100 people on a bus. You know, and, and, and um, it's dramatic when you see how much space is occupied by 100 people driving as opposed to 100 people cycling or 100 people on, on a bus. Um, so the reason we won't in all likelihood, charge people for standing is because what we call the negative externality of standing is, is very minimal. But the negative externality of making a decision to get into a two-ton vehicle, I suppose I, th I think about that. It's like we've created a society where at very low cost in the decision you make to just get in a couple ton hunk of metal and maneuver it wherever you want. It's just interesting to think about that, that value, that we have chosen to build a society around that value. Most of the rest of the world hasn't done that. You know, they've decided to make some determination with respect to the negative externality of that individual decision to get into a car at a particular time. And I just, I think it's interesting, this is why I like this topic, I think it's interesting that we've structured a society where we believe we have a God-given right to do that, to move around in a, in a two ton, ton or more or less um, piece of metal. And, and it's just interesting to think about all of the consequences of that. I love cars too, you know, so I do like driving too. A lot of us do. But we, ne we love it so much, I think, that we neglect all of the costs that follow from that decision. Uh, thank you. You have mentioned congestion, energy consumption, and emissions. L let me pose a, a practical hypothetical situation. <clears throat> Let's say I live in an apartment building which is not within a convenient walking distance of a supermarket, and I'm in a suburb which doesn't have a bus system which goes directly from where I live to my s supermarket. So if I use my own car, there are two trips, one to the supermarket and one back. If instead I call Uber or Lyft, there are six trips, one to come and get me, one to take me to the market, one to leave me there, one to come back and get me, one to take me home, and one to leave me there. That's more congestion, more energy consumption, and more emissions, not less. So wouldn't it be better for me to have my own car right at my apartment, and I make two trips instead of cause six trips? Well, so what you're describing is a suburban style of development which really is based around the automobile. And so if you accept, I guess, those kind of conditions, then there's definitely something to what you're saying. But the part you didn't factor in is the price of the parking. Um, I think by some estimates up to 15% of uh, trips by automobile now are Uber or Lyft. And, and, and um, that does help with respect to, to, to alleviating the pressure to build more parking. Um, but I suppose what the Schupistas would argue is that um, there are high costs to the decision that we've made, say, since World War II, to do a lot of our development on that kind of suburban model. But I, I think you're right. I think 
you know, if you accept that constraint, then it could be um, optimal to, 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 to make a trip to the market, as you said. But I think a lot of this science of parking and the new urbanism is an attempt to kind of interrogate whether that is the best model of development with respect to the environment, with respect to freedom and mobility and access and so on. I, I feel like I shouldn't <laughs> dominate every, you guys should feel free to jump in as well. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, what the optimum thing would do now that we're really faced with these climate change issues? Uh, I imagine that bicycles would be good, but if you park a bicycle in a parking space, it can cause problems. How do you handle parking for alternate vehicles like that? Do you have any thoughts about what the ideal system would be? Well, I thought that was an impressive piece of the documents, the, the Claremont development. They had thought hard about the number of automobile trips that we would have to um, eliminate if we want to meet climate targets. Um, well, I mean, of course, there's a logistical challenge to accommodating, say, bicycles, but the amount of space that a bicycle takes up is so minimal compared to what you need for, for a car, especially in a structure. You know, curbside requires less space. In a structure, as we saw, it's 330, 350, maybe even 375 square feet. Think about how many bicycles you could fit in that amount of space. And of course, you also don't have the emissions from the bicycle that you do from the, the automobile. Um, but certainly one of the advantages of eliminating mandatory minimum off-street parking is that you make the urban space more accessible to, to, to cyclists and to pedestrians. Sometimes I ask my students at the beginning of my class, how many of you cycle to, to school? And very few do, even if they live close. Because when you don't have an infrastructure that supports cycling, it feels dangerous. I cycle all over Los Angeles, and people often say to me, well, how can you do that? Isn't, isn't that dangerous? And it is, it is, it is dangerous. And, and, and I'd probably do it more if we had an infrastructure that supported cycling. Now I have to say LA, I've been in LA for almost 20 years, it's gotten so much better with the Sharos. And also the Google Maps helps a lot <laughs> because it tells you the, the best route. Um, but, but it's a kind of if you build it, they will come situation where if you create that infrastructure, I mean, if any of you have traveled to say the Netherlands where people cycle or to, to, to Germany, you see that people of all ages will cycle because it's safe, because they have the dedicated bike paths on the sidewalk they, they have a culture that respects cyclists. And so you'll see people very young to very old um, uh, cycling. And so the, 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 I think the culture kind of follows from the investment in the infrastructure. So you've <clears throat> focused mostly on number of parking spaces per dwelling unit, which are good things to do. Could we, we talk a little bit about uh, the cruising, the occupancy, and also when parking is enforced? Uh, we have, I think, an issue here in Claremont. We definitely have an issue with cruising. If you want to see it writ large, come down here for the um, Christmas tree lighting, and then it's really uh, out in the open. We also have the issue of when parking is, is, is enforced. We stop doing it at 6 p.m. Uh, and we basically, we, we don't do it on Saturdays, although we have some 20-minute spaces that are supposed to be enforced. And on Sundays, of course, we're all good Christian church-going folks, so we all go to church, and all of our businesses in the village are closed, and there's, nobody, there's no commerce whatsoever in the village, so there's no need for any enforcement of parking on Sundays. That's a joke. Okay, so, but, you know, what, how do we address that? Because one of what I see is we have two- and three-hour spots uh, if you can get into those spots at, at 3.01 or 4.01 p.m., you're good for the rest of the evening. And we have some businesses that really need to have the 20-minute spaces and they need to be enforced, but we really don't have the resources necessarily always to enforce that. We have, we have 
um, and it's not taking away from anybody who works for the city. This is, this is just a matter of it, it gets done when it gets done, but sometimes it doesn't. And we have people who, you know, hey, I found a spot, or it's Saturday, and I can park in front of my job all day, or, and they don't quite understand that that's going to impact their customers. So what do we do to explain, and I'm not saying this because Jennifer's right in front of me, to explain to the decision makers that, you know, there's a period of time that we are needing to maybe not only enforce parking, but have, the, have it be um, enforced. I mean, over in Laverne, you guys do parking until, what is it, 8 or 9 o'clock at night? In, yeah, but okay, but I'm just saying, in other words, I've been over there. Santa Ana does it until 10 o'clock at night. So it's, it's more, and, and, and I fear because what happen, what's happening is we're going to lose a lot of our businesses that need that short sort of in and out or that, you know, I'm coming in just to pick up something up and get out of here. We have a movie theater that hmm, may not be around here much longer because they don't, their people who are coming down to the village want to go to a movie, can't find parking because there's no enforcement after 6 p.m. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, well, I actually think that one's pretty easy, and, and the idea is just all parking should be priced all the time. Um, I had a car for a few days when I was in, mostly I didn't have a car in Spain over the summer, but for a few days I had one, and they price all parking all the time, so including overnight parking, um, and that'll get you that, that, that turnover. So that's one where, as I say, I feel like we have the principle it's been studied all over the world. If you get the new Donald Shoup book, you see it's like 60 chapters, people doing empirical work all over the world studying parking. And that's one that we have the answer to. Performance-based parking that varies based on demand. It can be very cheap overnight if there's not high demand, if, you know, past a certain hour. But yeah, certainly you wanna have variable pricing through those dinner hours so that you get turnover. And yeah, even for people who work at the establishment. You want to have um, performance-based parking for them as well. Now, one issue that came up at Laverne when we built the structure was some people, and often it's the lower paid employees who are more constricted in terms of when they can come and when they have to park. So what you can do is you can rebate some of the cost of parking. So for the city employees, for example, they should still have to pay to park, but you can return some of it in the form of a, you know, of a rebate. Um, so that, but you don't want to return it all because then you remove the incentive to walk, travel by other means, carpool, and so on. Um, but you can rebate some of it so for, for purposes of equity. So that's an, also an option that, that, that we have when it comes to, say, city employees. I'd, I'd just like to focus a bit on the parking benefit districts, and I, I think it would help if we could imagine the sorts of um, projects and expenses and facilities that would be supported by parking benefit districts, because you've talked, I think you've made a very strong case for the fact that parking really is expensive, and it's just a matter of how you pay for it. So it's sort of like looking at the the shell game, you know, and figuring out where is that hidden cost. And so if we can see where the parking benefit district's money, collection money would go, you can begin to begin to see how we might, might make this uh, transition. Yeah, that's great. The, um, you have beautification, you have tree planting, you have public art. It doesn't matter, so, I mean, that's a democratic process too. You want to involve the neighborhood in terms of making the determination as to how that money can best be spent. But the key principle is whatever you choose, you, you could do planters, um, all kinds of things, but to but, uh, improve bus stops. And there's, there's, there's many, many options. Um, but the key point is that whatever you choose, the money has to stay in the community. That's what we've learned um, over the course of studying these parking benefit districts is that if it's perceived that people are paying into these meters and the money is being taken out of the community and spent somewhere else, you lose the political support for the performance-based pricing. By contrast, if, and, and of course you also wanna be very public about um, 
how you're, you're spending the money from the parking meters. So very clear to everyone in the neighborhood the tangible benefit that they're getting from this system of performance-based parking. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are so many options. You can do improve the sidewalk, you can improve the road, beautification, you can do street lights, you can do tree planting. Uh, bike lane is a big one. Yeah, either the Sharrows or the dedicated bike lane. Um, th there, there, there's so many ways that the, I mean, you, you've all, an example is Savannah, Georgia. Is anyone, it's one of the most beautiful places. And what they've done is limit parking. And their streets are absolutely <coughs> gorgeous there. They, they've refused to sacrifice every spare piece of asphalt to, to, to their automobile. And what's interesting is this has, of course, a benefit for Savannah. Everyone wants to go visit Savannah. So it has this um, economic effect on, on, on the city of Savannah. So, you know, you can plant, you can plant trees like they have um, on, on those streets. And um, again, it's, it's not so much what the neighborhood chooses to spend the money on, it's that the money be invested in that neighborhood. So you want to do all kinds of neighborhood council work to make sure you have a good sense of what, what the neighborhood desires the most. So let's take the theories you've got here to the limits and to your question about the trips back and forth to the store. What if you had to make no trips? Just forget it. You take a grocery store, get rid of the parking. How much do the groceries go down, more or less? A number. A percentage. Okay, so, it, it, so would... If this was the parking lot to your grocery store, and you just said, we don't have any more parking, we're delivering everything, would the prices be the same? Think of it. And like for churches, we have the internet now. There is nothing you need to go to a church to get that takes a car. Well, there's a lot of really interesting work being done on how parking lots could be converted into kind of new urbanist LED housing. I know that wasn't quite your question, but... Um, the question is, the trade-off is, get rid of the parking, do people pay the same for groceries? Right. I think everybody can hear me, right? Yeah. Everybody pays the same for groceries. They don't have to do anything. No Uber, no trips, no pollution. Right. You take electric vehicles back and forth and you're yeah. done. And then the second thing is, for stuff where you don't even need to go there, because the product being delivered <clears throat> is talking. You're, I just taught Edward, Bellamy, Edward Bellamy's looking backward, and okay. Edward Bellamy's looking backward. It's written in the late 19th century, and he's imagining life in the year 2000. And, and, and his, part of his utopia is that there's a system where there's a, some kind of a speaker that comes into your house, and you can listen to the preacher <laughs> Not only do we have that, you can listen to every sermon from every... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I mean, wh one of the arguments... So, I guess you and I would disagree about the desirability of being able to opt out of social interaction <laughs> that way. And, and, and um, I would, I guess, identify as a kind of a new urbanist and see the advantage, um, as I said, in being able, for example, in, in Puerto del Sol, where I was staying in Spain, just being able to walk right outside, do your shopping, go out, Enjoy the nightlife and just be around people of all ages because it's accessible for everybody. Why so, you live above the Amazon distribution center? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know that now you just click a button and it's there the next day anyway. So, <laughs> you just click a button and whatever you want from Amazon's there the next day anyway. So, I don't know that you need to live above. Oh, 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 you're talking about for for emissions. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the 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 you're you're getting beyond my capacity for economics and social engineering when you ask about how much would the groceries cost, you, you, you know. Um, 
Well, sure, sure, sure. There certainly will be a place, and you guys could say more about this than I could probably. Um, there certainly will be a place with respect to sustainability and fighting climate change for um, all of these efficient ways of delivering goods and services that, will, um, that won't require us to get into a personal vehicle and, and, and burn carbon in order to have our basic needs met. But probably other people in here could give a better answer to that one. I think it's <clears throat> very interesting to consider these different ways of organizing. And I, too, have been to Amsterdam and <clears throat> to Barcelona, um, stoplights for, for uh, bicycles in Amsterdam, and whole parking structures for bicycles only in Amsterdam. However, here we are in the middle of suburbia, and it's probably the same thing that you, can, you had to deal with in Laverne. They had um, businesses next to your, your college, and they were afraid that people would be parking there and they would lose their businesses. Um, so we have the same kind of thing going on in Claremont right now. I personally know at least six people who don't go to the theaters and the and lunches here or dinners here because parking is going to take too much time and be too hard, so let's just go next door. So that's the problem. In LA, you don't have an alternative right next door. But here in suburbia, you can just go up on Foot Foothill and Laverne or wherever it is, and you've got these things available. And so um, we just had a vote in this town where the voters said, and the merchants said, if you add three quarter percent sales tax, which would be essentially 38 cents on a $50 purchase, you'll hurt me. Okay, now you're advocating that everybody who parks in front of their store in the entire town is going to be paying significant money to be there. So therefore, they envision their customers just going to another city to buy that. So where do you have an example of putting this kind of planning and in the middle of suburbia and it working without killing the town? It's interesting that you bring all those, those points up because every one of those things you mentioned happened when we built the structure at, at Laverne. First thing I said when we built the structure at Laverne, based on all of these principles, I said, well, th 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 this is dumb because parking behaves like gas, not like a liquid. So you can't push it from one place to another. It expands based on capacity. And that's because there's deferred trips and um, th there's people who would take alternate modes of transit and so on. But anyway, parking expands. And for a while I looked dumb myself because the parking lot didn't fill at Laverne. I said, huh, because these principles would indicate that it would fill because demand would expand to capacity and then we'd be right back where we were and spilled over into the streets of Laverne. Well, it took, <laughs> I guess it's about two years, year and a half to two years, but now it's happened. Uh, and, and very often there's not a single spot in the huge structure that we built, and we're right back to people spilling over into the streets of Laverne. Now, I mentioned the VP of building and space, and, and he said, I get it now. He said, here's the problem, this is the point you raised. He said, we can't apply those principles here if the city of Laverne doesn't implement them as well. Because if we do performance-based parking on campus, but parking is still free in the city, our students will opt to park in the city and walk to campus. And so you raise an important point, which is that this has to occur across a region. It has to be regional. But we've talked about this all the time in my, in my class uh, on urban land use, so the answer to all your questions is regionalism. But regionalism is one of the things that the US does really poorly because our politics is based on local autonomy and we give cities the power to determine their own policies. So, so I don't know if anyone here has a, any experience with um, San Bernardino associated governments. Yeah. Or you have Southern California, yeah. A a a and their power is very limited because much like the UN, they're dependent on the will of their constituent members. Um, now, do I have an example of a suburban community where performance-based pricing has worked? Um, there are some in the Rutledge, <laughs> Donald Shoup, uh, the, latest, the latest book. I, th I think um, 
I don't know how suburban it is, but I think he gives the example of Boulder. I don't know if you consider that's not particularly suburban, I suppose. But there are some in there. Um, they're not coming to mind. But you, you raise an important point, which is that probably something like this has to occur regionally. Um, and that there is this risk that, and I know cities worry about that, that if we charge for parking in front of our movie theater, people will go <laughs> wherever to watch a to watch a film. But the ticket price offset would come out even, right? <laughs> That's the whole idea. Yeah, well that, that, I mean if, if, if you're charging ten for a ticket, yeah, yeah. rather than yeah. but at a, at a free parking. Yeah. That was just one. Nine and a buck for a parking. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I mean, could, could you end up charging less for the ticket to the theater if, or the, the good or service that you're providing, if you were um, raising revenue off parking or not charging? And that's my idea with the groceries. Yeah. In other words, back it down for the, yeah. back the grocery cost down and then charge for the delivery. You get to stay home, Uber can go. Yeah. Out and you get your groceries because nobody really wants to go to the store. Who cares? I mean, that, that's like the worst. That's like going to the gas station. Nobody I wants to go. Yeah. Follow principles of urbanism. It's actually a pleasure to go shopping. It can be a pleasure to go shopping. See, I would say that you, you what you, you're. Re <laughs> I would say that that is a reaction to that suburban model of development that we were talking about earlier. And that if you have principles of new urbanism, if you have higher densities, it's actually a pleasure. It's actually something to look forward to. Like going to a restaurant, I get it. Going to something where you can only get it at that place. You, you can tell that we crave this. A bunch of canned goods? Shut up, bring it. Well, but we, we, you can tell that we crave this, even in America, right? Because we build these sort of faux marketplaces that are meant to look like European marketplaces, you know? That, that, that you walk in, and because some part of us craves that experience of going vendor to vendor. Thank you. You said two words that kind of scare me to death, utopia and social engineering, because this is Claremont and we're very unique. Um, there's a, a lot of presidential candidates right now going around talking about the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. This is a prime example of how the poor gets poorer in the state of California and can't afford to live here. With our gas tax, the recent registration increase on our cars, and now making them pay parking that is regressive to, um, to their income. And, and it's not who we are here in Claremont um, because we're welcoming to all and we feel as though everyone has the right to come here and enjoy our amenities. And so if you put a price on parking, that prohibits those folks from coming here um, to Claremont. And, and there's 350 million people in the United States, and this is utopia. This would have to be a utopian ideal where everyone changes overnight. Otherwise, communities get locked out Competitors will seek our shoppers and our diners, and with Upland next door, Montclair that um, offers movies and restaurants, and Laverne, um, this would this would block out a lot of um, shoppers, and it would be regressive to those who can't really afford to maybe pay parking to come to Claremont. So how do you address that rich get richer and poor get poorer um, idea when we are implementing regressive taxes um, left and right here in the state of California? I guess a, f a few responses. So I actually think the system we have now is regressive in the sense that poor people who don't even own a car are paying so that rich people who do can have either free or very inexpensive parking. So I would say that is something that's regressive in the status quo. Um, and when we talk about performance-based parking, that doesn't mean exorbitant prices at all. The prices will be high in areas of high demand. But one of the, right now, everyone pays the same. That's regressive. You know, no matter how much you have, put, pay the same, whatever it is here, 50 cents an hour, free, okay. Um, when you, now, now when you have performance-based, 
It is in the sense, though, that if you have free parking, that's still paid for, right? It comes out of something. So we pay for it in our capacity as consumers and renters and homeowners and so on. And as I said, poor people typically or very frequently don't have a car at all, so they're paying extra for something they can't even benefit from. But I'll just make one other point about performance-based parking, which is that, as I said, if you vary the price based on demand, it gives people with less money the option to park a little bit further away. So I did that a couple times this morning, even with this thing, because going to doctors in LA, they, you could pull right in, I guess, to the garage and they charge you like $2.50 for every 15 minutes. I just walk like a little further, you know? Um, so that is, in a way, a kind of a version of performance-based parking. You just want to institutionalize that. But I take your point that, that um, it is a real issue. And I think it's even more of an issue when we talk about the same principle with respect to congestion pricing on the freeways. Because um, the same principles apply to relieving congestion on the freeways. Um, but it's often the poorest people who are least flexible in terms of the times that they can drive. But there are um, ways of responding to that. You can do the equivalent of like the earned income tax credit for the, 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 the congestion charge. There, there are ways that it can be addressed. Would performance-based parking be also a time of day dependent? Absolutely, it's absolutely. It's this Goldilocks principle of varying the price. And we're so good at, I mean, we have this technology, this beautiful thing. In the video, Donald Shoup talked about these two big innovations, the parking meter and the mandatory minimums. But we have this amazing one now, which is that we can sense as cars go in and out. And so we can know on a given block through computers how many spaces there are. And so the meters can be programmed to increase and decrease the price. I mean, the other benefit to businesses, as there's fewer cars parked on the street, the price will come way down. You don't want to make it free, but you can bring it close to free. You always want there to be some cost to the decision to get into the car. But that'll be good for business, too, because the price will come way down. It'll incentivize people to come. So absolutely, for sure, you have to always price parking, and you have to vary it at all times of day. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about parking minimums in TOD. The city is working on their Village South-specific plan. The draft just came out, and the parking minimums are between 1.5 and 2.5 spaces per unit. Do you think that's appropriate? So my reaction to that would be that um, I think it's better if the city gets out of the business of mandating these minimums and focuses on managing curbside parking and leaves the, the market, the, the capitalist marketplace, to determine how many parking spaces to sell with a given unit. That's why I said there's gonna be a role for capitalism. Um, so, if you go back to this idea of the sorcery of trying to decide how many spots is appropriate. I just think it's strange that we love markets in this country and we wanna let the principle of supply and demand determine prices, but when it comes to parking, we feel like we have to have the state, in this case the municipality, intervene and make some determination. But again, there's no way of knowing what the appropriate number of spots is. It's gonna fluctuate based on supply and demand, and that's where the market is at its best. So I guess that, that was the reaction I had when I read that. You know, why not let the market make that determination? I still haven't really heard a good argument against that. I mean, developers are good at that, right? You, 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 there's, a, there's a market for something, a capitalist will provide it, right? I, I don't know why we don't exploit that power of the market when it comes to things like uh, uh, um, residential development. If, if it were individual businesses choosing to charge their own customers for parking, then it would be market and it would be competition, the, 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 but you're not talking about a, a private entity charging for parking. You're talking about a public entity charging for parking. That's a monolithic curbside, yes. charger. 
curbside gas. Yeah, that's not a market-based system. That's just an it arbitrary is. system that says. We're it actually is a market. It, it actually is a market because it's, it's, it, it's driven by supply and demand. It is the revenues appropriated for the city, but that's just for the um, curbside parking. Private entities can supply, based on demand, the off-street parking. So I would say create those two markets. One is the kind of market run by the state, which is the curbside parking, and the other is the market that's subject to the vagaries of the capitalist marketplace, and that would be the structures in the off-street parking or the parking that comes with you know, renting a, an apartment or, or buying a house. Okay, I think we'll take our last question here. Let me run to the back. You have your hand up this whole time. Hi, um, I have a few questions and concerns. I'm sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. You do say that no off-street parking requirements. What is the city supposed to do in regard to um, vehicles such as RVs, sports trailers, work trucks, 18-wheeler rigs, um, do you suggest market price curb parking for those items also? Um, in many cities, they are required to be stored away, out of sight, and not visible from the street, which means that the home or the apartment building can provide spaces for those things. If a developer is not required to offer off-street parking to its tenants um, or buyers as in a condo, then what happens in that? Um, the other, th and so I'm concerned about these, ex what I call accessory or work vehicles. Um, many people like to have off-site, um, off-street parking because of privacy concerns and security concerns. The largest increase in crime in San Francisco and Seattle this year, or last year, were smash and grabs. Thousands of cars every year, smash and grabs. Window popped, purse, computers, whatever. The cars didn't even have to be unlocked. They don't even test them because of the alarms. They just smash the window. I was the victim of a smash and grab here in Claremont. Broad daylight, um, not at my home, where my, my car is usually parked in the garage. Um, what? I'm kind of dismayed that you're encouraging curbside parking. Big LA article uh, in the LA Times today about the smash and grabs on the west side. Particular circumstances, tourists were the targets and imported gang members, but I expect this to become a really big crime issue. And the more cars parked overnight or even during the day on the curb, um, the more we're going to have that. Life and death of American, the American city. Um, she talks about raising children in Greenwich Village in the 1960s. And at that time, if you can imagine it, it was a low income neighborhood. And she said that it was a very safe neighborhood because there were a lot of eyes on the street. And so what you're raising with the smash and grabs is a public safety issue. And I think the response needs to be a public safety response in part, but principles of new urbanism can actually do a, new urbanism can actually do a lot to, to, to decrease crime because when you have people watching, I remember I parked downtown Beverly Hills and uh, got into a fight over parking, much like the George Costanza episode of Seinfeld. And um, these guys want to kill me because I guess they thought I took their spot. And uh, I got out of the car. I think it was in front of Nate Now. Someone was asking about Nate Now. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, I said to the person standing in front of Nate Now, oh, do you mind keeping an eye on my car? Because I think as soon as I walk away, they're gonna, they were really angry. They might like key my car, something like that. And um, the 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 manager said, oh yeah, yeah, I really wouldn't worry about that because all these people plus cameras. Um, and so when you have a vibrant urban space, that actually can help to address the issue of crime. Um, the, the, the question of the RVs and the work trucks, um, I guess again, I would say, 
I don't want to be harsh, but if you buy an RV, you're making a decision to, there are externalities associated with that decision. And some of those externalities ought to be paid by the person who makes the decision to purchase that vehicle. Now, many options, again, the market, as I say, if you have people who want a place, safe place with a guard to park a car, you can pay for that. You can pay for uh, an off-street parking lot, again, provided by a developer. And if you're willing to pay a little more, you can probably have 24-hour security or a gate and so on. But it seems to me we need to bring these decisions we make with respect to the vehicles we purchase or drive into line with the consequences that the decisions we make have on the rest of society. And my argument would be that that's going to benefit the vast majority of us the vast majority of the time. I do appreciate the concern about pricing parking and the effect that that might have on someone who drives a motorist who's low income. So I wouldn't go so far as to say it's going to be perfect or utopian for, for, for everybody all of the time. Um, but I think it's quite clear from the science that most constituencies will benefit from performance-based parking most of the time. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, before you guys go, um, <coughs> Drew brought us in some of the new calendars for uh, 2020. So I have a stack of them. I'll put them up on the table. Please feel free to, free to grab one on your way out. And thank you all so much for your lively discussion, a lively dialogue about this important topic. Really appreciate it. Thank you.